Good morning. Good morning. This is Carissa with the Praying Warriors Tribe. Um, I'm just sitting here in my truck while my kids are doing their chores inside, getting ready for school. So I'm taking this moment to be with you. So welcome, welcome. <clears throat> so today is week one, day two of Steadfast Love by Lauren Chandler, Psalms 107 study. And this week, um, we are focusing really on the first three verses of Psalms 107, which I'm going to read from the Passion Translation, which is my favorite translation. I really, really wish that we had an Old Testament version with this translation because it's just it's so filled with God's love in this this version. So Psalms 107 verses 1 through 3 says, let everyone give all their praise and thanks to the Lord. Here's why. He is better than anyone could ever imagine. Yes, he's always loving and kind and his faithful love never ends. So go ahead. Let everyone know it. Tell the world how he broke through and delivered you from the power of darkness and has gathered us together from all over the world. He has set us free to be his very own. And I'm so thankful that the Lord has set me free to be his and that it's a continual work in progress that there are just a lot of things that he's healing within me, lots of traumas, lots of hurts, lots of pains that he is healing within me, but I'm so thankful that he loves me enough to put forth that time and effort. So day two, um, it begins with breaking out the dictionary again and writing down the first three or four definitions for worship. And what I looked up was the feeling or expression of a reverence and adoration for a deity, adoration or devotion comparable to religious homage shown towards a person or principle, and honor given to someone on recognition of their merit. So Lauren continues with, I appreciate the dictionary.com frames worship as mostly a religious activity because it is but it doesn't exclusively occur inside the walls of a church, synagogue, or a mosque. Worship is the air we breathe. In other words, if we're breathing, we're worshiping. Now the question is, what or whom are we worshiping? To worship means to have our mind's attention and heart's affection focused supremely on an object or person. This doesn't have to be a deity. It can be absolutely anything. So I want you to ask yourself the following questions to discern the object of your worship. Answer yourself with gut level responses, not with what should be your answer. What occupies your mind the most? Right now in this season that we're in, what occupies your mind the most? What do you love? What can absolutely ruin your day? And what can absolutely make your day? Now I went ahead and, and I answered these myself and you know I discovered that I still have a lot of fear that can sneak its way in and that's something that I am working on with the Lord is fear of um, what's happening within this nation not necessarily the virus but more or less what's going to happen in the coming month once we have election 
Um, who is going to be voted in as our president? And how is that going to affect our nation? And, um, you know, I have to keep reminding myself amongst this is that, you know, God is in control. And no matter what, I'm, I'm constantly telling myself, no matter what, the election cannot be, cannot outrig God's will. And that's something that we're having, you know, I'm sure this is something on a lot of people's minds right now is, you know, how is that going to play out? And then what does that mean for what's going to happen within our cities and our streets? How is that going to affect how people respond? Um, you know, and, and it's a constant reminder because I see a lot of the spiritual battle, the spiritual warfare that was going on within our nation. And it really, really is God's will versus the enemy's plan. And, you know, honestly, I, I haven't been praying for one, um, one opponent to win versus another. I've been really trying to focus my prayers on God's will prevailing and on us as his followers, as his children, to be filled with strength, his strength, and for our faith to be solidified and strengthened so that way we can stand firm in him regardless of what happens. And that's hard. That's hard. We all have beliefs of who it should be. And regardless of what side of the spectrum you fall on, I encourage you that if you are watching this before that time, I encourage you to pray that prayer. Um, because for all we know, God's will could be exactly the opposite of what our desires are. Because he has a much bigger picture than we do. And he might bring, be needing to bring something in, whether it's uh, a reprieve, more of a reprieve for our country, or whether it's for prophecy to be fulfilled in some way. And I don't want to be the one praying against that. But these are the things that have been on my mind, you know, fear, but also, you know, I take that to the Lord. I try and I try and instead of constantly going around and talking to everybody about it, I take that to the Lord instead. All of us have something that occupies our mind. Has our love can ruin our day or can make our day. It's part of being human. It's part of being created in the Imago day, the image of God. So turn to Genesis 1, verses 26 through 27. And we're going to read that. Genesis 1, 26 through 27. So I'm reading from the Amplified Version. Then God said, Let us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, make man in our image according to our likeness. Not physical likeness, but a spiritual personality and moral likeness. And let them have complete authority over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, the cattle, and over the entire earth, and over everything that creeps and crawls on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image and likeness of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Genesis 1, verses 1 through 25, recounts the story of creation. Light, dark, heavens, earth, sky, waters, vegetation, fish, birds, creeping things, beasts of the earth, and livestock. Finally, he makes man, male and female. Mankind is distinguished from the rest of God's creatures in how we resemble God represent him in the world, and relate to him and one another. So how do we resemble God? Well, according to the Bible, 
we resemble God in spirit and morality. Because of this, we can have a relationship with God and men and women can reflect God's nature. We do not resemble God necessarily in physical form, at least not in that time. Once obviously Christ came, then yes, we became resembled, we resembled him in human form. So what does a representative do? And how might we represent God simply by being human, not necessarily Christians? So I looked up the word representative and a lot of it, you know, referred to governmental things, but a representative is chosen or appointed to act or speak for God. We can represent God by speaking or showing love, grace, mercy to others, being kind and doing acts of kindness to others. Uh, literally right before this video, I was listening to um, a sermon from Haberfield Baptist Church, which is based in Australia. Um, the pastor there is Matt. Oh, his last name just left me. Um, anyway, it was on, uh, it was on, the title was Designed to Love. And what it all revolved around was we, when we were created, we were created to, and designed to love. We were not designed to fear. We were not designed to have anxiety. We were not designed for all of these negative things. We were originally designed to love. And no matter if we're Christian or not Christian, our base design is to love others. And I thought that was really amazing that because it's God's perfect love that casts out all fear, love is the premise. We are called to love God with all of our hearts, minds, and souls, and to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. The basic design of us is to love. So how were we created to relate with God and others? And the hint here was to read Genesis 2, 15 through 25. So I'm just going to pull that up again. 2, 15 starts with, So the Lord God took the man... That he had made and settled him in the garden garden of Eden to cultivate and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, you may freely, unconditionally eat the fruit from every tree of the garden, but only from the tree of the knowledge, recognition of good and evil, you shall not eat. Otherwise on the day that you eat from it, you, sh you shall most certainly die because of your disobedience. Now the Lord God said, it is not good, beneficial for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper, one who balances him, a counterpart who is suitable and complementary for him. So the Lord God formed out of the ground, every animal of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called a living creature, that was its name. And the man gave names to all the livestock and to the birds of the air and to every animal of the field. But for Adam, there was not found, found a helper that was suitable, a companion for him. So Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. And the rib, which the Lord God had taken from the man, he made, fashioned, formed into a woman. And he brought her and presented her to the man. Then Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and shall be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed or embarrassed. So how were we created to relate with God and each other? I said to be companions. He, God, wanted to walk with us daily. 
talk with us. That's the whole reason why Adam and Eve were placed in the garden was to be able to commune with him freely every single day. We are to enjoy each other's company. So how is mankind doing at all of this? Depends on who you're around. But I would say as a whole, uh, we're probably having some issues. I don't know about you, but my Facebook feed seems to be filled with a lot of hate and disdain. And I have to really search hard for the love and for the companionship and for the kindness. Um, you know, it's, it really does depend on who you're hanging around with and how that affects you is how then you will then project yourself. How are you doing with this? For me, I know I have to catch myself. Right after the debate, I had to delete a couple of posts because I just decided that it wasn't worth it to, ha to project my own feelings and opinions out there. Um, you know, I, I'm passionate. I'm very passionate about the things that I believe in. And... Um, while passion is okay, I know that God loves the passion that he has placed within me. We also have to make sure that we are projecting our passionate feelings and opinions and love. And even though I don't feel like I really veered all that far off, um, I just went ahead. It's not what I want my Facebook feed to be filled of. Um, really and truly. So I just deleted some things and I'm just making a very conscientious decision to just not. <laughs> but most of us, I would say, are probably not doing all that great in this and how we are dealing with others. Even if you love God and seek to worship him, it's a struggle to resemble, represent, and relate with him in a way that honors him, isn't it? It's something that we are constantly battling. It's flesh versus spirit. Very strongly. <laughs> There's a good reason for this. And it's called the fall. And it happened in Genesis 3. The serpent deceived Eve. While Adam stood beside her doing nothing to prevent the worst catastrophe in the history of man. We will get into the ins and outs of this exchange later in the study, but for now, let's focus on its consequences. The bottom line is that the Imago Dei, which is, I had to look this up because I'd never heard that phrase before. Imago Dei refers most fundamentally to two things. First, God's own self-actualization through humankind. And second, God's care for humankind. So the bottom line is that the Imago Dei was marred and all creation suffered. Adam and Eve's choice to believe the serpent over God resulted in a fracture that makes resembling, representing, and relating with God in the way he, inten he, he intentioned impossible on our own. Ain't that the truth? Instead of simply resembling him, we want to be him. Instead of being his representatives on the earth, we abuse and exploit creation for our consumption. Instead of relating with God and each other from a place of being freely loved and freely loving, shame and selfishness infiltrate every relationship. Essentially, we replace the creator with the created. Our worship is broken, but it's not extinct. We are still worshiping something. Martin Luther says, whatever your heart clings to and confides in, that is really your God, your functional savior. When I first read Confides In, I immediately thought of a line in the Golden Girls theme song. You know, the lyric that says, your heart is true. You're a pal and a confidant. 
took me years to finally understand the last word, a confidant. What is that? Then as I grew to have sensitive information about myself and others, I understood what it meant to confide, to trust someone with the deep and the dark. Although confides certainly means that here, it can also mean putting our trust in something or someone. Much like how I confided in the chair I'm currently sitting on to be strong enough to hold me. So what are some things or people in which you confide or find stability? Who are those people? After the fall, not only are we now more prone to worship and confide in something other than God, creation itself groans. Pain, suffering, and death plague us. We are desperate to find something that can sustain us, especially on darker days. Throughout the rest of this study, I will be using the image of the anchor to represent the object of our worship, that which we cling to and confide in. The anchor symbolizes hope and stability in the uncertain current of a post-Genesis 3 world. In our broken relationship, we tie our hope to false anchors, people or things that don't have the strength to save us. My prayer for you in this study is that you will let God use the seasons of pain, struggle, and uncertainty to expose the false anchors. And in exposing the false, I pray you are able to see cling to and confide in the true anchor, the God of steadfast love. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much that we have this knowledge that you are the perfect love, that you are who we can confide in. And I pray that I continue to learn to put my trust, the utmost trust, into you. And I pray that those watching do as well. Thank you so much for your steadfast love that we know that we can depend on, that you are our true anchor. We love you and we praise you. In the name of Yeshua, amen. I hope this is a blessing. And I look forward to tomorrow. God bless. Have a wonderful day.